The doorbell rang loudly. Nadine's voice came from the depths of the mansion from far beyond the living room. Erica, someone is at the door. Yes, ma'am, she replied. Erica frowned as she walked towards the entrance. She muttered to herself, Do you think I'm deaf? Don't I answer the door every day? She adjusted her arms on her apron and straightened the lines of her long, white, long-sleeve button-down blouse. Loose black pants and comfortable flats completed her work outfit. It wasn't what she wore while cleaning her apartment. There it was, sweatshirts and a worn-out T-shirt, and her hair was pulled back under a bandana as opposed to the neat and intricate French braid she wore to work. Still, as a maid's uniform, it was appropriate. She was glad she was never told to wear the iconic lace black-and-white miniskirt and low-cut top that had been a big disappointment to her son Brady's roommate, Thomas, when the two young men arrived from college. She smiled, remembering the young man's distressed look when he saw her in her work uniform. As she walked into the kitchen, she heard Thomas say, I thought she'd be in something sexy, you know. Yeah, I don't need to see that, Brady said. Okay, she's still a beauty. Shut up, idiot. It's my mom. Concerns about exactly this were on her mind when Erica first took the job. She had heard horror stories about domestic staff working with the moneyed class and what happened to them. She assumed that such an outfit was a harbinger that the owner of the house would make an attempt on her life. But this did not happen. Edward Blanton always treated her with respect and dignity. Of course, she knew that she was his housekeeper and he was her boss, but his communication was always related to work. He thanked Erica for her efforts, and her bonuses weren't bad. Edward never said anything suggestive to her. She probably thought because his head was glued to Nadine's ass. As much as Erica respected and liked Edward as an employer, she also disliked his wife, Nadine. Erica's father, a salty soul if ever there was one, would describe Nadine as someone born with a silver spoon up her ass. At least 20 years younger than her 60-year-old husband, Nadine was vain, arrogant, condescending, and stingy, and Erica considered these to be her good qualities. She had seen Nadine's fierce, vindictive nature, which had, so far, never turned on Erica. Because she needed the job and it paid well, Erica would often bite her tongue, say, Yes, ma'am, then go home and hit the punching bag in Brady's room. Erica sighed as she walked to the front door. Edward was blind to his wife's true character. When he could tear himself away from his corporate boardroom, he spoiled her and practically gave her a check for whatever she wanted. He was a decent man, but he was far from the first decent man to be married to a narcissist. And like most narcissists, Nadine had perfected the art of showing her husband only what she wanted him to see. She opened the door to find another Beverly Hills socialite, about Nadine's age. With her nails and hair perfectly manicured, Julie Hastings was dressed in fashionable clothes, sunglasses that probably cost four figures, and a diamond pendant that probably cost more than Erica made in a year. Botoxed lips and bleached blonde hair completed the stereotype, and Erica could barely contain her laughter. She bowed her head in greeting to the visitor. Good afternoon, Miss Hastings. Good afternoon, dear. She walked in as if she was expected, which she was. I'm not late, right? No, ma'am, you first. Erica sidestepped the condescending use of the word darling to refer to someone a decade older. There was no point in raising this issue. Mrs. Blanton is hosting today in the solarium. Would you like me to tell you? No, thanks. I know the way. She walked deeper into the house. She was almost in the living room when Nadine appeared from afar. The women greeted each other with false warmth, with formal hugs and painful air kisses on the cheeks. Each woman immediately started telling the other how good they looked in their cute outfits. Erica hated insincerity, but worrying about the drama of mature trophy women wasn't her job. She returned to the kitchen where she began preparing trays of appetizers and light desserts for the meeting. Most of the work had already been done by Francesca, the Blanton's plump Latina cook. But that day she had gone to attend her granddaughter's baptism. Erica remembered Nadine's annoyance when Franny asked for the day off, saying there was a Shrub Foundation planning meeting that day and they needed food service that day. Edward replied that family was important and gave Franny the day off. With her wings clipped, Nadine gave in. 
although Erica thought her eyes said Nadine would remember this insult. Franny had prepared almost everything for Erica in advance and left instructions for the few remaining tasks. Erica gave Franny a small baby gift, hugged her, and wished her luck. More people arrived, mostly other high society denizens with too much time and money to waste. Erica sighed as she listened to the chatter and light laughter in the solarium. She believed in charity and helping other people. But the charities that Nadine and her circle were involved in seemed more interested in socializing and demonstrating that they cared than in actually doing things. For example, the Shrub Foundation's goal was to plant more greenery in public spaces to beautify and prevent soil erosion. In the six months they'd been dating, Erica didn't think they'd planted a single plant. She glanced at her watch. 10.49. Nadine ordered the food to begin serving at exactly 11. Erica checked, but everything seemed fine. The last tray of crab cakes was under the grill and she needed to cut two loaves of sourdough bread. She was just getting ready to grab a bread knife when the doorbell rang again. Erica went into the hallway to open it. The door opened to reveal a tall, blonde man with blue eyes and a handsome, masculine face, dressed in a smartly tailored suit. Despite his attractiveness, the man exuded a smugness that immediately alarmed Erica every time she saw him. Still, she nodded at him. Good morning, Mr. Decker. Please come in. Thank you, Erica. She resisted the urge to shudder. His tone and the way he lingered on her made her feel as if his gaze was leaving trails of mucus wherever it landed. However, the man worked for Edward, so she couldn't directly accuse him until Decker directly propositioned her or sexually harassed her. He never did this, but just watched her. Erica smiled again, this time effortlessly. They're in the solarium, sir, about to start. Would you like me to take you there? Please. She led John Decker deeper into the house. She felt his eyes staring at her butt, but she tried to ignore it. Erica stopped at the door and gestured to him. Decker gave her a cold smile and went inside. Erica headed back to the front of the house, ignoring the squeals of delight from the women inside as the hens crowed over their rooster. She stopped at the entrance and looked out the side window, and there he was, standing there, at the tinted windows of Decker's limousine, dressed in a black suit. He brought the cigarette to his face, took a drag, and exhaled. Even from a distance, his boredom was visible. Erica hurried back to the kitchen and finished getting ready, keeping her eyes on the clock. At eleven o'clock sharp, she carried the trays into the sunroom and placed them on the decorative sideboard. Nadine's guests came over to help themselves to their plates. Erica heard many compliments towards Nadine, who beamed with pride, as if she was the one standing in the kitchen kneading bread and shelling nuts. A few minutes and a few trips later, she brought out all the food. She quickly checked the drinks bar, which had been prepared before the guests arrived, and everything looked good enough. Erica glanced at Nadine, who ignored her, and then walked away. She knew from bitter experience that she should not address the lady of the house in public without her permission. If Nadine needed anything at this moment, she would have looked at Erica, waiting for recognition. But the immediate tasks are over. She opened the front door. As soon as she did this, the man's head turned in her direction. Erica looked back, and since the corridor was clear, she beckoned him to enter. He smiled at her, put out the cigarette under his heel, and walked to the door. Erica watched him approach. When he reached the porch, she said, Hi, Peter. How are you? He shrugged. Same song. Come into the kitchen. I think I have enough left to set the table for you. In fact, Erica left some food just in case Peter drove Decker around. What will you drink today? I drive, so only water. Thank you, whatever. They entered the kitchen. Peter took off his cap and placed it on the tabletop. Erica took the plastic-wrapped containers out of the refrigerator and began assembling the food onto a plate for him. She watched him from the corner of her eye. Of average height and slight build, Peter Chang looked sharp in his black chauffeur suit, trousers, white shirt, and thin tie. In Erica's eyes, his mixed Caucasian and Chinese heritage gave him the best features of both races. 
His handsome face had a timeless beauty. Although she knew Peter was in his fifties, he could easily pass for a man in his thirties. At this thought, Erica touched her braid. She was still dark, but the first gray hairs were just beginning to emerge. Although she hadn't asked permission to invite him into the house, a house that wasn't hers, Erica decided it was a bit of a risk. The Blantons always told her to show hospitality to their guests. If Peter is found in the kitchen, she will explain it by saying that he needed to use the toilet. She handed him the plate. Eat to your health. A growing boy like you needs nutrition. Peter snorted. Of course, the only way I'm growing now is in width. He took the plate. Erica's gaze dropped lower. What's your waist? Thirty inches? Thirty-two? I think a few extra pounds wouldn't hurt you. He took a bite of the chicken in the garden pita bread. You are the kindest soul. First you feed me, and then you flatter my pride. The girl is trying. They chatted for a bit while Peter ate. Every fifteen minutes exactly, she returned to the solarium to check if she needed anything or needed refilling. She collected a few plates, but other than that everything was fine. Nadine and her coven began, discussing purchasing trees and shrubs to plant. Erica noted that for every five minutes of chatting, there were about thirty seconds of action. Every time she visited, she caught Decker's gaze on her. When she returned to the kitchen after her second visit, Peter was leaning back on the counter and rubbing his stomach. Erica smiled at this. Ever since he casually mentioned that he never had time to take a lunch break when he was at work, she always made sure to prepare something for him whenever Decker stopped by, which was quite often. Franny helped her, sometimes preparing a small meal for Peter, and even joked with Erica about her boyfriend. Erica always blushed and waved it off, but she admitted to herself that her day became a little brighter when Peter stopped by. He finished eating. Thank you, Erica. Very tasty. I'll pass on your compliments to Franny. She did most of the prep work. I just warmed it up. Still good. He picked up his plate. What should I do about this? Oh, I'll take it. She hurried forward, took his plate, and put it in the dishwasher. All is ready. Thank you. How is your son? Good. He made the honor roll for the second time in a row. He's doing really well. Just two more years and I'll have a college-graduated son. She placed the back of her hand on her forehead, closed her eyes, and a melodramatic note entered her voice. Oh, the pains of aging, Peter shrugged. You're not that old. On days like these, I feel all my 49 years. You don't look 49. Her ears perked up. Is it true? Peter's face remained completely serious. No, 47 maximum. She laughed and threw a kitchen towel at him, although without force. No wonder you never got married. No woman would want to put up with such language. I know, I know. Speaking of married people, how long do you think today's Save the World Committee meeting will last? Um, I'm not sure. I know Mrs. Blanton doesn't have anything scheduled for the rest of the day. Why ask? He took a deep breath. Because I have to take Mrs. Decker Wallace to physical therapy this afternoon, and Mr. Decker gets mad at me when he has to take a taxi or ride share. Poor girl, Erica muttered. Amanda. Decker Wallace was a pretty little blonde in her early thirties. Erica had only met her once, but found her pleasant enough. Unfortunately, Amanda developed perineal nerve palsy in both legs. Milder cases were common among people who spent a lot of time squatting. However, the cause in her case remained unknown and left her unable to walk without assistance. The Wallaces were old money and had the best doctors on their staff. The forecasts were good, but progress so far has been limited and slow. She heard the Blantons discuss it and got more details from Peter, who took Amanda to physical therapy three times a week. Peter was technically in the service of the Wallace family, not John Decker. He was safe if he left his husband to drive his wife, but that didn't make his life any easier working alongside Decker. Erica understood his desire to avoid problems if possible. Peter stretched. Yes, her appointment is at two, so in order to take Mr. Decker to the office and back to her house, he must leave no later than 12.30 to get her there on time. He sighed. So, just one more hour. Erica pursed her lips. 
The meeting in the other room could easily last that long. Suddenly, Peter smiled again. Are you still drawing? Yes, sure. Erica's excitement increased. She tried her hand at oil painting, following old Bob Ross shows, with moderate success. Brady patiently talked to her about it, although she felt like her son was just being polite and wasn't really that interested. She understood. Her own mother talked to Erica about cross-stitching to the point where Erica wanted to poke her eye out with a knitting needle. She was not offended by her son. He was a good guy who supported her in many ways, and their relationship was strong. He simply had no interest in crafts. On the other hand, Peter seemed genuinely interested and always asked about her latest projects. When she showed photographs of her paintings, he offered criticism and support. She never felt like he was offering full support because once or twice he didn't like something, he said so, and Erica appreciated his honesty. She wondered if Peter was only being so sweet because he wanted to get into her pants, and then she suppressed the thought, thinking that she could just let him. They talked for a few more moments before Erica heard voices approaching. She pointed to the small bathroom next to the kitchen. Peter nodded, walked inside, and closed the door. Erica wiped her hands and went out into the corridor. Nadine and another woman walked forward. Since it was a nice sunny day, none of the guests brought Erica an umbrella or a coat to hang in the closet, and since the hostess of the house accompanied the guest to the exit, she did not have to go out and say anything. The couple stopped at the door and did another round of hard, fake hugs. The other woman left. Nadine looked around and spotted Erica. We need another bottle of champagne. Without another word, she headed back to the solarium. Erica took it out of the wine cabinet. She had heard Edward Blanton tell his wife to give up the champagne and stop wasting it on friends, but Erica had no intention of going against her wife's direct orders. Nadine will have to deal with the consequences with her husband. She rummaged through the drawer until she found a corkscrew with a lever. You know, Peter said, standing at the entrance to the restroom, I bet I could do like in the movies and cut this guy's head off with a long knife. She grinned at him. Probably rip your fingers off instead. Just sit there until I get back. His quiet laugh followed her out of the kitchen. She put the champagne in a bucket of ice, took out the empty bottle, glanced at Nadine to see if she needed anything else, and returned to the kitchen. So where were we? You imagined how you sympathized with my future missing hand? How did I do this? Use your imagination. Erica giggled and blushed. A small part of her mind scolded her for acting like a frivolous schoolgirl. The rest of her was enjoying this too much to care. They chatted for another 30 minutes, interrupting only when Erica went to check the solarium or when the guest left, accompanied by Nadine. Except for the first trip, Nadine hadn't spoken to Erica, which was fine with her. She was glad it was almost over. Cleaning up the mess in the kitchen would take some time, but she still thought she could finish her duties by five. Nadine walked the last woman to the door and said goodbye. She looked into the kitchen. Mr. Decker and I need a few minutes, Erica. We're done eating, so you don't need to check on us anymore. Yes, ma'am. Peter reappeared, brow furrowed. He'll make us late. I know it. Maybe he won't. They joked some more. Peter talked about his new drone, which he bought and test flew the day before. Erica smiled at this. So boys never give up their toys, right? Are they just getting more expensive? He grinned. Kind of like little girls who play with dollhouses and keep hoping for a country house with a white picket fence, right? Same idea, bigger toys? She was laughing. Touché. They talked for a few more minutes. Peter glanced at his watch. 1225? I hope he will be ready. I can... Erica stopped herself. She started to suggest going back and telling Decker that Peter was waiting so they could take his wife. It was probably the morally right thing to do. It would also be beyond her capabilities and would probably get her fired, and she couldn't afford that, especially with a son in college when it cost her all her money to keep him there. Luckily, Peter understood her intention. He shook his head. No, I don't want you to get in trouble for being too presumptuous or whatever these people say. If he doesn't leave soon, I'll just have to leave. Erica bit her lip. She still wanted to help. Well, I'll just go down and see how things are going. 
Maybe they're finishing already. He looked doubtful. Just to stop by. Okay, but don't get yourself in trouble. She grinned. I won't. Erica frowned as she approached. The massive wooden sliding door that separated the sunroom from the hallway was closed. She stopped outside and listened. A faint moan reached her ears. Someone is injured. She reached for the handle to open the door. Her fingers barely touched the brass device when another, more insidious possibility arose. Her eyes widened. No, this can't be true. All she could do was open the door a crack without making a sound. The moment she did this, the noise inside increased tenfold. Erica looked inside and regretted it. Nadine Blanton hunched over one of the sofas. Her stylish skirt was thrown over her back. John Decker stood behind her, his pants pulled down to his ankles. Nadine let out a series of soft moans. Erica stood frozen and disgusted. All she could think about was Amanda waiting for her husband to let the driver go back to them, unaware that her husband was jeopardizing her coming to a doctor's appointment so he could enjoy his mistress, and about Edward, who came home and kissed his wife, not knowing that, just a few hours earlier, she had been with another man. Nadine's fingers spread on the glass of the solarium. They did this right in front of the window. Erica grimaced. On Monday. Gardeners are off today. No one walks around the backyard to see them. Erica noticed that Nadine was leaving fingerprints on the glass, something she would have to clean up. For some perverse reason, the thought caused irritation, the incongruity of which almost made her laugh. The raising of the lovers' voices forced Erica to act. The two seemed as if they were on the verge of completion, and she had a terrible feeling that she might be noticed. The two were turned slightly away from the door, but if Decker turned his head, he could see her. A sudden fear seized Erica. Getting fired might be the least of her problems. Was Decker violent? How might he react? Even if nothing physical happens, it will be her word, the word of the working servant class, against theirs, the word of the wealthy elite. Erica had no illusions about how this film would end. She closed the door. There was a small thud as the wood closed, but the lovers were either too loud or too self-absorbed as their moans continued unabated. Erica retreated into the corridor as quietly as possible. Peter was leaning on the countertop, looking at his phone when she entered. Seeing the look of concern on Erica's face, his smile disappeared, replaced by a serious expression. Erica? What happened? Peter? They? What? She took a deep breath. Decker bent Nadine over the sofa. What? He stood up, fully erect. Are you kidding? I wish I was kidding, Peter. I didn't look long because I didn't want to get caught, but I know what I saw. That bastard. How can he do this to Amanda, especially with everything she's going through? She's a wonderful person. She doesn't deserve this. I know. Erica wrapped her arms around herself. She thought of Edward Blanton, and a huge wave of sympathy washed over her. Edward is a good guy and a great boss. Even if I think she's a psychopath, he just adores Nadine. It will break his heart. Peter stared at the wall for a moment. Erica, you can't tell him. She frowned. What are you talking about? I'm not going to let this... He raised his hand. I'm not talking about letting them handle it but right now it's just your word against theirs. You didn't take a photo with your phone or anything, did you? No, I didn't. I thought if they caught me watching, no one would believe me and I'd be fired, so I ran away. She looked in the direction of the solarium. It's too risky to go back and do one right now. I agree. He took a step forward and placed his hands on her shoulders. Peter's gaze never left her. I'm with you, Erica. We'll deal with them, but we'll be careful, okay? Just act normal. Can you do this? Erica nodded. I think yes. I mean, you didn't love her anyway, so it shouldn't change much. Just keep your eyes and ears open. I'll do the same. Let me think about it. We'll get through them together. Peter let her go, pulled his wallet out of his pocket, and handed her a business card. Call me in a day or two and we'll figure out how we'll do this. I'll do it. In the meantime, you better get moving.
he glanced at his watch. Yeah, although right now I don't feel bad about leaving him. Call me. Peter turned to leave, but Erica put her hand on his arm. He looked at her. She smiled, leaned over, and kissed his cheek. Thank you. He responded with a smile and hurried to the door. Erica tidied up the kitchen, keeping an eye on the clock. It was almost one o'clock in the afternoon when she heard voices in the corridor. Nadine and Decker walked past the kitchen entrance on their way to the front door. She heard the front door open, a muffled curse, and hurried footsteps approaching. She concentrated on washing one of the pans. Nadine walked into the kitchen with Decker behind her. Erica, did you see the driver, John? Did he say anything to you? She briefly considered saying that she hadn't seen Peter, but the security cameras would have shown him entering the house. Erica said, Um, he came in to use the restroom. We just said hello, but he said he couldn't stay, and mentioned something about a meeting. Decker frowned. Amanda, that's right. Nadine, can you call me a taxi? Sure. Erica, get on with it. Nadine escorted Decker out of the room. Erica sighed and reached for her home phone. Her cell phone rang. Erica looked at him and smiled to herself. It was a call from Peter. She checked the timer on the elliptical and saw that there were five minutes left in her hour-long cardio workout. Oh, to hell with it. She slowed down and picked up the phone. Hello, Peter. Hi, how are you? Just at the gym at my apartment complex, finishing up my routine. She got out of the car and headed towards the stairs. I'm sweating right now so it's time for a long, hot shower. I think I'll just stand under it for a while and let the water run over me. Peter was silent for a second. That's a pretty colorful description. You really know how to unsettle a guy with your prepared speech. Erica laughed again. She realized that she had been laughing a lot more often since she and Peter had started their project, which they had dubbed Operation Catch the Scoundrels. They exchanged notes every few days, and whether or not they found anything to use against Nadine and John, she found herself looking forward to talking to him more and more each time. Well, I definitely didn't want to distract you from your mission. He laughed out loud. Come on, I don't mind the show. She blushed. Well, good, because I don't have anything for us. They watched the volatile couple for weeks without collecting any evidence. They tried to eavesdrop on the conversations by recording on their phones, but nothing worked. When Erica suggested trying to hack John or Nadine's phones for incriminating text messages or installing a tracking program, Peter rejected the idea. In addition to getting fired, he said it could lead to criminal charges, and she was forced to admit that he was probably right. On Erica's side, Nadine had several unexplained absences where Erica suspected she might be secretly dating John, but they were all outside the house. Peter reported the same thing during the hours he took Amanda to her appointments. Erica became increasingly frustrated and began to question their strategy. She often wondered if they should have just told Edward and Amanda and let the cards fall as they pleased. At the same time, she was able to spend more time with Peter. They met one or two evenings a week at her home to compare notes. Inevitably, their conversations shifted from frustrations over their failure to find information about Nadine and John to conversations about themselves, which slowly died down as they looked at each other. Then one would cough or look away, trying to get them back to business. Every time this happened, Erica would blush and clench her thighs nervously. His next words brought her back to the present. Anyway, I called because I might have something for us. Thoughts of teasing Peter faded into the background. Trying not to seem too interested, Erica said, Oh, really? What? Do you know anything about the Shrub Foundation's plans for Memorial Day? Erica was painfully aware of Nadine's plan to throw a huge charity party as a fundraiser for the Foundation. She planned to host it at the house and went crazy organizing the event. Major figures from the Los Angeles social elite were invited. Nadine even secured the presence of one of the tycoons from a prestigious national organization that builds homes for low-income families through a partnership in the local area. It was talked about as one of the biggest events of the year. As a result, Nadine almost went crazy. Suddenly, nothing in the house was good enough. 
nothing was clean enough. Erica was forced to work with three new temps to clean the place. She felt sorry for the grounds crew, half of whom had been fired and replaced for failure to follow directions or something Nadine had made up on the fly. Nadine's pre-event mania was stretching the last of Erica's patience to the limit. All this went through Erica's mind instantly. She clenched her teeth. Yes, I know all about it. She drives you crazy, doesn't she? To the point of insanity. Peter laughed. Well, she talked to John about it. He's involved in all the preparations. I think working with his boss's wife, he might seem involved in the process. That's not all he's involved in, Erica muttered. I overheard them talking today. I think they're planning on making a video montage at the charity event to make everyone cry. You know, the standard emotional bullshit about building houses and planting trees and so on. They're going to show it on the big screen throughout the party. Fine, he said. Well, I was just wondering, what do you think would happen if we replaced this stuff with something more interesting? What do you mean? John suggested that Nadine should have some fun in the middle of a charity evening. It would be an extreme thrill, as he put it, to do it while all the guests were around. Nadine agreed, saying that they would enjoy their afternoon pleasure even better if they did it while, I quote, suckers empty their wallets. Erica shook her head. Could they really be so stupid as to take such a risk? I think so. They're too arrogant to believe they'll get caught. Nadine told John she could have sex with him right in front of her husband, and he'd never know. Then she said something about an old garden house, named him their love nest. Do you understand what she means? Yes, the cottage at the far end of the garden. It's a guest house that Edward set up a year or so ago. It's a nice little cottage. They sometimes house visitors there. She thought about it. Yeah, it's on the opposite side of the house from the charity event. So what's your plan? I have, well, friend is too strong a word, acquaintance, let's put it that way. Anyway, this guy is a computer genius. He's an expert at installing cameras to, uh, blackmail people. Usually catches them doing shady things. Business deals. Anyway, he can set up the whole house so we can put it on the big screens and show everyone what's going on. I asked him and he said it would be easy and would take very little time. How much is it? He doesn't even want the money, just so he can keep a copy of the recording. There was disgust in Peter's voice. When he found out Nadine Blanton was the target, he said he could sell it for more than we could ever pay him. Erica's lips quirked. He sounds like a fine gentleman. He's not, but that doesn't matter. That's the best part, Peter said. She could almost see his smile over the phone. This guy can also get his hands on some other illegal stuff, in this case, event-level fireworks. He said if we could get him on his property, he might set us up with something that would scare the crap out of them. They, they'll rush out right in front of everyone. Trust me, I saw what he's working with. They'll think the place was attacked by the Air Force. You're mixing with dangerous people, Peter. That's a driver's job. I can't say for sure if I've driven anyone from the mafia, but I've definitely worked for guys who know how to break a law or two. Anyway, I helped this guy out once, and he told me must. How did you do this? I'll tell you over breakfast sometime. Erica frowned. She reached her apartment and went inside. Sounds too complicated. I know. Sounds like some wild plan dreamed up by some crazy writer with too much time on his hands. But I think it'll work. She hesitated, then shrugged to herself. Okay. Well... I'm with you. I'll call my boyfriend. I'll need you to take him to the grounds the day before the event to set everything up. Maybe something else will pop up before then, but otherwise just stand there and look pretty. I can do this. Erica smiled. You really think we can do this, huh? I think yes. His voice had lost some of its gaiety. Erica, I want to try. I don't want to keep watching them get away with it. I mean... If you think we should just film them and give the film to Edward and Amanda, we can do that. That way, we will not humiliate them publicly. Erica thought about it. She didn't want to humiliate her boss or Mrs. Decker Wallace. She thought that the shame of cheating would be hard enough. 
let alone if it happened in front of everyone. I don't know. I mean, maybe if they knew it was coming. She stopped. A smile appeared when the idea was born. Peter, you didn't happen to record their conversation, did you? Of course, just as we discussed. Video? Yes. Wonderful. Erica felt a surge of excitement. Here's what we'll do. She outlined her plan to him. When she finished, Peter said, That's good. Do you think they'll agree? I think Edward will agree. Amanda, you tell me. I think I can convince her. Yes, I like it. He fell silent. You have a really big brain. Fine. Erica smiled. There was a slight tremble in her voice. If everything works out, you can show your gratitude to my big brain and all my other parts. Peter whistled. If I didn't know better, Erica, I'd think you were proposing to me. You don't know better because that's exactly what I do. She cleared her throat. We plan to meet tomorrow. I want to discuss all the little things and do this so I can see that appreciation. Erica watched the whirling celebration from the by window window in the SUNY room. 200 Anxiao citizens of Los Angeles milled about the lounge and erected tents, exchanging jokies. A light hum of conversation drifted through the open doors at the end of the hall, as did the soft music accompanying the promotional video that played endlessly on the giant screen. She wondered about the effectiveness of this approach. The video should have been shown once, after the guests had had a few cocktails, and the Shrub Foundation could have given an inspiring speech. The recording could then be played when everyone's attention was focused to maximize the impact on both their hearts and wallets. Regardless, the video was shown over and over again until guests began to ignore it. She laughed at herself. When did you become a PR expert? Maybe it's just common sense. Or maybe you now find fault with everything Nadine does. Erica watched Julie Hastings flirt and have fun with the media technician, a thin young man barely older than her son, who had been hired to operate the big screen. Hastings wrapped her arm around his neck and rubbed her purchased breasts against him before they disappeared. Even from a distance, Erica could clearly see his hand resting on her ass. God, are any of these people faithful? The object of her scorn emerged from the crowd, her hand intertwined with Edward's. Although it was only eleven in the morning and the charity event had only lasted an hour, she already had a shaky step which Erica recognized as the owner of the house had already been drinking heavily. In contrast, Edward wore a wooden smile as he moved next to his wife. His back was straight as an arrow. Edward nodded to the guests but said little. Erica wondered what he was thinking about. The sound of footsteps in the corridor attracted her attention. She left the sunroom and escorted the woman to the restroom, waiting to see if she needed anything before leading her back. She checked that everything was still clean and then returned to her post. As soon as she approached the window, her cell phone beeped. Peter's message read, Target's in motion. She took a deep breath. Erica left the mansion and headed towards the tent, where the audio and video equipment for the big screen was located. She caught Edward's gaze. Erica gave him a quick nod, and he nodded back. Edward then approached John's wife, Amanda. She frowned but nodded and signaled to several people standing nearby. The small group moved away, Amanda with the help of her cane and Edward supporting her on one side. On the other stood a mountain of a man in a suit and sunglasses. Erica's heart went out to the two devoted spouses. This will be very difficult for both of them. Thank God they have each other and their families to lean on. The small AV equipment tent was filled with consoles littered with knobs and switches. The cables lay on the manicured grass like a stack of spaghetti. Through the mesh window, she had a beautiful view of the large screen. Erica took the folded piece of paper out of her pants pocket, unfolded it, and spoke the words twice. Her hands were shaking, and she tried to remain calm. Her phone vibrated again. Another text. They're inside. Eyes in and on the house. The welcoming committee is in place. Wonderful. Erica felt a surge of excitement. Here's what we'll do. She outlined her plan to him. When she finished, Peter said, That's good. Do you think they'll agree? I think Edward will agree. Amanda, you tell me. I think I can convince her. Yes, I like it. He fell silent. You have a really big brain. Fine. Erica smiled. 
There was a slight tremble in her voice. If everything works out, you can show your gratitude to my big brain and all my other parts. Peter whistled. If I didn't know better, Erica, I'd think you were proposing to me. You don't know better because that's exactly what I do. She cleared her throat. We plan to meet tomorrow. I want to discuss all the little things and do this so I can see that appreciation. Erika watched the whirling celebration from the by window window in the SUNY room. 200 Anxiao citizens of Los Angeles milled about the lounge and erected tents, exchanging jokies. A light hum of conversation drifted through the open doors at the end of the hall, as did the soft music accompanying the promotional video that played endlessly on the giant screen. She wondered about the effectiveness of this approach. The video should have been shown once, after the guests had had a few cocktails, and the Shrub Foundation could have given an inspiring speech. The recording could then be played when everyone's attention was focused to maximize the impact on both their hearts and wallets. Regardless, the video was shown over and over again until guests began to ignore it. She laughed at herself. When did you become a PR expert? Maybe it's just common sense. Or maybe you now find fault with everything Nadine does. Erica watched Julie Hastings flirt and have fun with the media technician, a thin young man barely older than her son, who had been hired to operate the big screen. Hastings wrapped her arm around his neck and rubbed her purchased breasts against him before they disappeared. Even from a distance, Erica could clearly see his hand resting on her ass. God, are any of these people faithful? The object of her scorn emerged from the crowd, her hand intertwined with Edward's. Although it was only eleven in the morning, and the charity event had only lasted an hour, she already had a shaky step, which Erica recognized as the owner of the house had already been drinking heavily. In contrast, Edward wore a wooden smile as he moved next to his wife. His back was straight as an arrow. Edward nodded to the guests, but said little. Erica wondered what he was thinking about. The sound of footsteps in the corridor attracted her attention. She left the sunroom and escorted the woman to the restroom, waiting to see if she needed anything before leading her back. She checked that everything was still clean and then returned to her post. As soon as she approached the window, her cell phone beeped. Peter's message read, Target's in motion. She took a deep breath. Erica left the mansion and headed towards the tent, where the audio and video equipment for the big screen was located. She caught Edward's gaze. Erica gave him a quick nod, and he nodded back. Edward then approached John's wife, Amanda. She frowned but nodded and signaled to several people standing nearby. The small group moved away, Amanda with the help of her cane and Edward supporting her on one side. On the other stood a mountain of a man in a suit and sunglasses. Erica's heart went out to the two devoted spouses. This will be very difficult for both of them. Thank God they have each other and their families to lean on. The small AV equipment tent was filled with consoles littered with knobs and switches. The cables lay on the manicured grass like a stack of spaghetti. Through the mesh window, she had a beautiful view of the large screen. Erica took the folded piece of paper out of her pants pocket, unfolded it, and spoke the words twice. Her hands were shaking, and she tried to remain calm. Her phone vibrated again. Another text. They're inside. Eyes in and on the house. The welcoming committee is in place. Erica looked at the center console and found the handle Peter had pointed to. It was marked VSRC. The indicator pointed to the number one. I'm glad he showed me this. I would never have understood it. The microphone was where she expected. She placed her hand on the next dial that read ASRC. She flipped it from one to two. In an instant, the music coming from the speakers disappeared. She also turned the VSRC knob to two. The video disappeared, replaced by a drifting camera pointing towards a small bungalow surrounded by flower beds and trimmed hedges. Even as Erica switched, the image jumped and wavered before stabilizing. Jesus, Peter, hold that thing tight, she grumbled. The drone image remains in place. Erica took a deep breath, picked up the microphone, and pressed the send button. Her eyes settled on the script. Ladies and gentlemen, let us ask you to turn your attention to the big screen. Your presenter, Nadine Blanton, and her partner from the Shrub Foundation, John Decker, are about to give a presentation. She clicked on the pre-typed text on her phone, visually confirmed. Go. 
The screen erupted in bursts of light and color as carefully hidden fireworks exploded around the guest house. Some were spinning on the ground, scattering sparks and flames across the gardens. Others shot into the sky, exploding above the roof. One broke a window. Thunderous explosions echoed across the lawn, causing Erica to flinch. If they were so loud where she stood, then they must have been deafening to the two lovers. She was laughing. I wonder how much they are enjoying their midday pleasure now. She looked outside. The beneficiaries alternated between looking at the screen and at the performance taking place above the roof. When the explosions died down, she heard someone shout, There! Let's! Several of those present hurried to leave. The bulk continued to stare at the screen, while the smart few, perhaps sensing some nasty shit was about to happen, headed towards the front of the estate and their waiting cars. The fireworks continued unabated. Peter wanted to show the cameras inside as well, but aside from breaking retaliation laws, Erica pointed out that a film about Nadine and John would be great leverage for Edward and Amanda in their divorces. Peter agreed with this. However, I hope the guy with the fireworks gets his money's worth. I will not be sorry if these images become public after the trial is over. Two people ran into the tent. The first was Julie Hastings. The second was a media technician. Hastings looked around, saw Erica, and was surprised. You? What are you doing here? Working, Erica answered. Who the hell are you? The young man barked, trying to look threatening, which almost made Erica laugh. She put her hand in her pocket and grabbed the heavy object. He took a step towards her. Get out of my way. I work directly for Mr. Blanton, she said. He's paying for it all. It's his property, and he approves of what I'm doing. You better back off. Chris! Hastings' voice rose to a shout. He reached out to her. Erica raised her hand, pressed the stun gun against him, and pulled the trigger. There was a boom, and Chris stiffened before falling. Hastings screamed. You killed him! He'll be fine in a few minutes, Erica said with a grin. If he didn't want to get hit, he shouldn't have tried to touch me. You, you... Hastings pointed a trembling finger at Erica. You'll get fired for this. Erica picked up the device and took a step towards her. Hastings screamed and ran away. Erica lowered the stun gun and snorted. Thank God she's gone. Movement on the screen caught her attention. The door to the garden house opened. Nadine and John ran outside. He was still trying to pull up his pants. She was still trying to button her blouse. The camera zoomed in on the couple, and it was clear that she was holding a crumpled bra in her hand. Anyone with half a brain could figure out what they were doing. As if someone had pressed a switch on their way out, the fireworks stopped. Erica laughed. In a way, that was true, since she was sure that Peter had pressed the stop button. Nadine and John froze, looking at something. Edward, Amanda, and their companions appeared at the edge of the screen as the camera zoomed out. They approached the upset lovers, stopping 15 feet away. Although there was no sound, the guests of the charity evening watched with fascination the performance unfolding before them. A man and woman in smart suits approached Nadine and John. Each one handed an envelope, one to John, the other to Nadine. As soon as she looked at him, Nadine collapsed to the ground. John, however, moved towards Amanda. She shouted at him, waving her cane. Edward pointed at John and said something. John froze, and even from the low resolution of the drone camera, you could see the blood leaving his face. Then John's face twisted with anger. He took another step, but a huge man with Amanda stood between them. The man's hand reached to his belt, where a holster with a pistol was clearly visible. John hesitated, then turned and ran. Nadine remained in a heap on the ground. Edward gave her one last look of contempt and, supporting the now crying Amanda, turned and walked away, leaving his soon-to-be ex-wife sobbing on the garden soil. Erica looked at the burned and destroyed areas of the garden, the remains of multiple fireworks explosions. She sighed. Burnt and ruined, like their reputations, two marriages and who knows what else. She turned the VSRC knob to off, and the broadcast disappeared. On impulse, she went off script and turned the microphone back on. While we appreciate your generosity to the Shrub Foundation, 
we ask that you give Mr. Blanton and Mrs. Decker Wallacey time to cope with today's events. Thank you and have a nice day. The stunned guests slowly moved towards the front of the house. Erica picked up her phone, stepped over the groaning Chris, and wrote, It's done. Yes, the answer came. Can I now express my gratitude to you? She smiled and a warm blush covered her skin. Her fingers quickly slid across the screen. I'm counting on it. Erica stared at the slowly rotating ceiling fan. The cool air washed over her sparkling skin. Her breathing was light and calm, and her whole body seemed wrung out. This thought made her smile. The light sound of falling water reached her ears. Erica stood up, walked naked across the carpeted floor of her bedroom, and opened the door to the bathroom. Streams of fog swirled in the airflow. Peter stood under the shower, head down as streams of hot water cascaded over his head and shoulders. She looked at his muscular back, narrow waist, and strong legs. She opened the shower door and walked into him. Peter blinked. Hey, thought you were too tired to shower. She put her hands on his shoulders. You're too hot for me to stay away from. Who would have thought that everything would turn out like this? She feared that without a general dissatisfaction with their employers, their contact would cool down and return to normal. Even as Nadine Blanton was still sobbing on the lawn of her soon-to-be former estate, Erica wondered what would happen to her and Peter. However, Peter obviously had no doubts. As soon as he saw Erica back in his apartment after the events of that day, he grabbed her by the arms, picked her up, and spun her around, laughing at the success of their escapade. As soon as her feet touched the ground, Erica threw caution to the wind and pressed her lips forcefully against his, and to her delight, he reciprocated. They left a trail of clothes all the way to the bedroom, which was the start of many wonderful moments. Since then, Erica practically lived with him. She was worried about her son's reaction, but it turned out to be unfounded. Peter and Brady hit it off immediately and got along great, spending time flying Peter's drone and discussing Elon Musk's latest space projects. Brady even told her, It's too early to tell, Mom, but I think he's good. Erica smiled at the memory. Her son was indifferent, or indifferent to previous boyfriends, which only increased her good feelings towards Peter. She looked at her watch, and her smile faded. After eating, she would unfortunately have to go, as the next day, Monday, marked the start of a new work week for both of them. Peter was technically on call 24 to 7, but his responsibilities were greatly reduced after John Decker was kicked out of the family. Likewise, Erica's job became much easier without Nadine hanging over them. The divorces continued and were nasty. Nadine pleaded with Edward, saying it was a mistake, but he was adamant. Seeing the writing on the wall, she tried to challenge their tentative agreement, but with Edward's money and experience, she had no chance. Last she heard, Nadine had signed an agreement in exchange for a lump sum payment before disappearing. Franny said Nadine had gone to the East Coast, but Erica didn't care as long as she went. John was much more aggressive, insulting Amanda and her family publicly and on social media. This continued until he was found beaten to within an inch of his life in the parking lot of his cheap apartment. From his hospital bed, he said, well, more like he wrote it, since his jaw was broken, that Amanda's father had sent thugs after him, but it couldn't be proven. Their divorce progressed through the courts, although after Edward immediately fired John after a charity event, John's money and opportunities dried up. They were all also questioned by the police in connection with fireworks and complaints from neighbors. Erica and Peter pretended to be unknown, as did Edward and Amanda. The estate's security cameras just accidentally malfunctioned that day, and nothing was recorded. Erica thought that the police knew more than they were letting on, but since this was an isolated incident that occurred on the grounds of a wealthy estate, the only damage was done to the estate, and no one was hurt. She assumed that the police were inclined to turn a blind eye instead of investing resources into an investigation that will be met with obstacles from the very beginning. Erica sighed. Despite all the commotion, they both still needed to work, 
Houses had to be cleaned and employers had to be driven everywhere. It will be difficult for both of them to see each other during the week. I guess that's life, right? As if reading her thoughts, Peter said, It's going to be a long week. When can we meet again? Probably not until Friday. Brady has the Howard ceremony on Wednesday. I took that time off, so it's going to be a bit of a busy week for me. Engineering scholarship ceremony? She smiled. Yes. Did he tell you? He invited me. He also said it would take a lot of the financial burden off of you. This is true. I congratulated him. Unfortunately, this is at the same time that I have to take Amanda to one of her meetings. Brady understood and said that we would spend time together later. Erica leaned on him. I'm glad you two get along so well. He's a good guy. He had a good mom to raise him. His hand wrapped around her shoulder and squeezed. Erica sighed. There was a knock on the door. Peter frowned. I wonder who it is? He headed toward the front door. Aware that she was wearing only a shirt and nothing else, Erica was left behind. She heard a brief exchange of words. The door closed and Peter returned, looking confused. There was an envelope in his hands. She pointed at him. What is this? What is... Delivery by courier. I don't know what's inside, but it's addressed to both of us. Erica became wary. Who would have known we were here together? Let's watch. He took a knife, carefully opened the top, and poured out the contents. A folded sheet of paper and a smaller envelope fell out of the envelope. Peter unfolded the page and held it so they could read together. Dear Eric and Peter, We apologize that we cannot do this publicly. We would like to openly thank those who warned us about the betrayal of our spouses. Unfortunately, there is an ongoing legal battle for both of us, and our divorces will be dragged out in the courts for a long time not to mention a police investigation into someone setting off numerous illegal fireworks in a residential area. So it's best if we keep it a secret. We both hope that you understand how highly we value loyalty and wish to reward it. Rest assured, when the dust settles and there is no longer any scrutiny on our finances, both of you will receive raises and improved benefits. We both had our suspicions, but we never thought our cheating spouses would be so brash or disrespectful. So we thank you for bringing this to our attention and allowing us to prepare our service to respond accordingly. We can't say we approve of fireworks no matter who sets them off. Erica blushed, but Pater simply smiled and said, They know, but they're just saying it to cover themselves. She nodded and continued reading. In the meantime, we agree that you should be compensated for your inconvenience. Please take this as a small token of our appreciation. And please be discreet about this until we can discuss it openly. With our respect and gratitude, E.B. and A.W. Peter said, Hmm, Edward Blanton and Amanda Wallace. Erica took the smaller envelope. What is this? He handed her the knife, hilt first. Your turn. She carefully opened the top and took out two pieces of paper. Paid for the name, she sighed. Peter frowned. What? Erica couldn't help but tremble. Peter, these are checks for $50,000 each. What? He took them from her. Damn, this is crazy. That's a pretty generous bonus. Maybe. He took her hand, raised it to his lips and kissed it. But that means your financial problems are over. The realization of this moment made Erica smile involuntarily and tears filled her eyes. She took the check and pressed it to her chest. I never expected this. I just wanted to make the right choice and help. Me too. Who knew we'd find the prize at the end of the rainbow? She squeezed his hand and kissed his cheek. I found much more than that. His answering smile made her feel a tingling sensation all over her body again. Erica laughed and said, Okay, let's finish these sandwiches. Peter picked her up and picked her up, making Erica laugh. Screw dinner. If I have limited time with you, I know how I want to spend it. Satisfied, she pressed her head against his neck as he carried her down the hallway. Her stomach growled and she laughed again. Quiet, I'll feed you later. There are more important things to do now. Peter carried her into the bedroom and carefully closed the door. 
subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you, and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.